recognize that gentleman, has an interesting uh, outlook on the future, doesn't he? Or he did. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down, and it has made all the difference in my life. Very early in our educational lives, we're told to plan for the future. In junior high school, they start in with that kind of stuff, don't they? You have to start thinking about college, a career. High school, they really start in with it. You have to network, and you have to plan for the future. You'd better start thinking about a good college. What are you going to major in? You'd better be a success. You're going to have to step up to big pay. I really did things all wrong. When I came to Weber State College, I looked pretty much like this. I was a baby. I had barely turned 18 years old in May of 1968. The war in Vietnam was raging around us, and I didn't want to go to the war in Vietnam. Some of my classmates had been drafted. I was draftable. Some of my classmates had volunteered, some had gone to war, some had died. I didn't want to go. I was against the war. Hell no, we won't go. Maybe I was afraid. I don't know, maybe it was a little bit of both. Hell no, I won't go. So the choice was to stay in school. I had an educational deferment. I always thought that I'd be an English major, and with that I would be the teacher, a college professor probably, but I'd always had a love of the theater, and I had a secret desire to be an actor, but being a theater major wasn't really very practical. That's what my parents told me, so English major it was. Uh, oh, I should tell you that um, Probably in late 1967 or early 1968, a theater professor named Dr. Leonard Rowley came to my high school and he offered me a scholarship for the theater department. Hmm. So throwing caution to the wind, impulsively I grabbed at that and said, I guess I'll be a theater major. I impulsively grabbed that chance thought, well, I'll be an actor then. Not a, not a theater professor, I'll be an actor. And so my fate was sealed. There was so much going on in 1968. The Vietnam War was a bloody backdrop. Let me give you just an idea of what happened between the time I graduated from high school. I mean, I graduated in what, I guess, June of that year, 1968, but, and then I went to Weber in September. But here's kind of what was going on. The Vietnam War is raging. Uh, in March of 1968, 500 Vietnamese civilians, from little children to adults, were massacred by American soldiers. Also in March of that year, Robert Kennedy announced that he was going to run for the Democratic nomination for president. And then 10 days after that announcement, he came to this campus to Weber State College and spoke in the old gymnasium. There are people waiting for him right here. I cut classes at Ben Lomond High School and came up here to hear Bobby Kennedy speak in the old gymnasium. He was going to be my president. I really think he would have won. In April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. In May, I turned 18. I was draftable. A little bit later on, uh, in June of 1968, Robert Kennedy was shot to death in Los Angeles. A few days later, I graduated from high school. In August of 1968, the Republicans nominated Richard Nixon to be President of the United States. The Democrats nominated Hubert Humphrey. 
There were riots in the streets of Chicago. And then in September, I came to Weber State College as a theater major. So, generous Leonard T. Rowley, a professor who saw some talent in me and a bloody war in Vietnam, arguably set the course of my life for the next seven years and arguably the next 45 years. Winston Churchill, undeniably a great man. He said this about looking into the future. It's a mistake to look too far ahead. Only one link of the chain of destiny can be handled at a time. Now, I'm not here to tell you not to plan for the future. That would be a foolish way to live. And I'm not here to tell you students who are preparing to do great and wonderful things with your lives not to plan, but I'm here to tell you maybe that if you're determined to do great things, you should also remember that there's a real world going on out there on the other side of Harrison Boulevard. When I was here, I thought that I was paying attention to the real world. I, I thought that I was doing the right thing, and I thought that I knew what was going on out there on the other side of Harrison Boulevard. Now, Weber State College was a great school back then. It's a great institution now. And I learned a lot while I was here. I acted in a lot of plays. Just one of the many plays I was in. And I was really a sensitive, sensitive person. <laughs> that picture was taken in that little grove of trees just south of this building. It was a bigger grove of trees back then. And I learned a lot of things. But I'm, I'm not so sure that my sensitive hippie ways were really the best way to get through when I went to graduate school some 2,000 miles from home. It was a bigger stage. Now the Weber State professors that I had at the time, they were good to me. They taught me a lot of things. They praised my work as an actor and they taught me a lot of things, but they also cautioned that when I left here, I'd have to learn to work harder. They said, Bill, you're going to have to work harder. You'll learn to work smarter. The competition will be greater. At least I think that's what they said. I should have paid a little bit more attention. Graduate school was one of the worst experiences of my life. I had gone from being a big fish in this little pond of Weber State to being a little fish in a big pond. I mean, it was a, not a pond. It was a, Jesus, it was an ocean. It was an ocean full of hugely talented actors and directors. And I almost didn't make it. I almost came home a couple of times. You remember. There were many times I almost said, I can't do this. I can't make it. I can't stay here. It's too hard. But gradually I learned to work harder. I learned to work smarter. I learned to focus, I learned to pay attention to what was going on around me, to learn what the talented actors and directors that were working hard did that I didn't know how to do or had not really paid attention how to do here at Weber State. I learned how to combine hard work and planning with the intuition that I had, and I started learning the value of paying attention. After graduate school and acting, I. I did some acting around the country after I left graduate school. I made it through, and I, then I started acting. I went from various theater companies around the country. I acted here and there, and I did all right. Um, but acting is a tough road to hoe, as you probably can guess. I, and I ended up back here in Utah, working at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. And when I was done with that, I didn't have any money, because that's what happens when you're an actor. You do a job, but you end up broke. So I came back to Ogden, my hometown, and I was offered a job in 1980 at a radio station. Fate intervened, and I allowed fate to intervene. I had a feeling that radio was something that I should do. And here I am, 34 years later, and 42 years later, standing at the campus that I graduated from. Sometimes you plan, 
And sometimes you just go for it. Now, two years ago, I had a chance to go to Nepal. It was an, and believe me, I'm going to bring this all around. I had a chance to go to Nepal. Uh, it's a trip I had always wanted to do. It was the trip of a lifetime. I met a man named Dean Cardinal through the radio station. Uh, he was on the show, and he runs a company called Worldwide Trekking. And Dean said, uh, I will let you go to Nepal with me. He takes people on these treks. I'll let you go to Nepal with me uh, uh, if just for the cost of airfare. Great. It's a trip that I always wanted to do. We will trek, trek to the base camp of, ne of Mount Everest. Uh, Dean said, you know, I think you can do it. I said, do you think I'm physically ready to do it? He said, you can do it. Do a little bit of hiking to get yourself in shape, but, you, you know, you can do it. I should have paid a little bit more attention <laughs> to what Dean was telling me and to the others who have gone on that trip before. Now, here's me on my birthday, May 19th. Uh, I had just landed in Kathmandu staying at a very uh, nice hotel in a very chaotic city called the Yak and Yeti. This is the day before we set out for 17,598 feet, the base camp of uh, uh, Mount Everest. Uh, I'm ready to go, I'm feeling confident, I'm feeling really good, but I, little did I know what I was getting into. I was not ready for this trip. Here I am on the trail heading for base camp. That's me in the front right there. I look great, don't I? <laughs> I really had underestimated the task at hand. That guy right behind me, that guy's name is Blair. Blair's happy. Blair's having a great time. Blair had prepared for the trip. He was ready. See that guy there? That's Joe. Joe's 15 years older than I am. Joe's having a great time. Joe was prepared. That's me, not a happy hiker unprepared, not ready. I had underestimated it. So, I was so, I, again, I thought I was going to have to turn back. I thought I was not going to make it, just like graduate school. For some reason, I got it into my head, I have to do something radical. I knew we were coming to a Buddhist monastery at Deng Boshe at about 12,687 feet, and I said to Gelgen, our guide, Gelgen, I want to get all of my hair shaved, sh head shaved. I want to get all my hair cut off by the monks at Teng Boshe. He said, Bill, why would you want to do that? I said, I don't know. I just need some inspiration, something to help me on this trip. He said, I'll talk to the monks when we get there. He talked to the monks. He, he said, it's a special request. I don't know. It, it was, the, the request was granted. He talked to the head lama who was there. Uh, he's not often there. Uh, he said, they have granted your request. It's unusual. He said, you have to meet the Lama in the morning. This is the head Lama at the monastery at Deng Boshe. He's 90 years old. He looks like he was out of Hollywood casting. He's a weazened little old man, uh, and he has gigantic brown glasses like Hollywood had cast him. I'm receiving a blessing from him there. And then the, I went out into the courtyard, and a young monk shaved off all of my hair, cut it off with scissors. Did the haircut help me get to the base camp of Mount Everest? Well, more hiking and planning would have helped a lot more than a haircut. But I did make it. There's the contrast. Oh, that, I wear that string around my neck to this day. It's the llama blessed that piece of string and put it around my neck. And, and I made it to the base camp of Mount Everest. And now, I do Radio from Hell with Carrie, Bill, and Gina. This is at Weber State, as a matter of fact. We're in the Union Building doing our show, I think, last year, two years ago. I do a grueling schedule of shows, 220 shows a year. We figure we have done 6,000 episodes of the Radio from Hell show. It is a successful and profitable show. People say, how do you do that? How do you do such a grueling schedule? I get up at 3.30 in the morning. I work for two hours at home. I go on this air at 6 o'clock in the morning. We do four hours of radio. We plan all the time. Uh, we have a great grueling schedule. And 
people say, how can you do that? The microphone goes on. They say, do you script it? We say, no. The microphone goes on. We improvise. Well, the only way we can do that is because we have planned day in and day out, and we have years of experience. It's only with a proper framework and with years of planning that you can allow yourself to soar. That's the only way you'll ever get through. Plan, plan, and pay attention. I don't think this guy at Weber State College would have understood that at all. Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you.